Hey, so when I first started making these level design videos, somebody left a comment asking me about the most recent game I've worked on, which is Alba A Wildlife Adventure. They were interested in it because it was so different to the action-oriented games I've worked on in the AAA space, and I'm personally keen to talk about how different level design can be across different projects. So this video is about what it was like to be a designer on this lovely little game. Alba is what I would call a mini open world game. It's set on a sunny island in Spain, and you play as a little girl called Alba, who's visiting her grandparents there for a week in summer. In some ways it's quite a conventional open world game, but all on a much more condensed scale, and I think with quite a unique tone and charm to it that sets it apart. The game also features wildlife photography as quite a key part of the experience, and I'll talk about what I did to set up all the animals for that later. So let's talk about all the different kinds of work that level designers did on this game. I'd say that the traditional role of the level designer on a game like this is what we might call the quest design and the scripting. Similar to many games in the genre, the game's quests can be split up into two categories. The main quests that progress the story, and also a collection of side quests that you can do along the way, which are purely optional and might take a little more looking around to find. As with all games by us two, Alba is designed with mobile platforms and accessibility in mind, so the gameplay in these quests is usually pretty simple and casual, so that anybody can enjoy it. Level designers would also set up all kinds of stuff outside of the quests, like setting up the logic that progresses the time of day system, implementing conversations and cutscenes, and also setting up what all the secondary characters are doing at various points during the week that the game takes place in. So as I've said in other videos, when it comes to single player games, scripting is often a really big part of the job, and showing experience with scripting logic and setting up gameplay situations and quests is one of the main things you want to show that you have experience doing if you're applying for this kind of role. Having said all this, the work that I ended up doing on this game wasn't the kind of traditional level design stuff that I just talked about. I worked with us two for the last nine months of the project, and by the time I was settled in, pretty much all of the NPC and quest stuff was being handled by another senior designer there, John Bai, who was a bit of a machine and basically did a great job of it on his own. So because of the needs of the project, I ended up working on stuff that might be better described as world design. This world design work mostly fell into two categories. The first chunk of what I did is kind of something between level design and environment art, in the sense that I was helping out with the broader layout and composition of various parts of the island, including sculpting the terrain, creating well-positioned landmarks, and helping develop a distinct identity for each area. To be clear though, my input was all about the visual composition in terms of how it affects the interactive experience and the exploration of the island, but I didn't do any modeling of 3D assets, and basically, if you think this game looks great, it's mostly to the credit of the art team and not me. The other big area that I worked on was populating the island with all of the wildlife it has running around. As far as I remember, we added over 600 animals in the end, divided into 60 different species, to be found, photographed, and ticked off a little list in your nature book. Deciding how to place and set up all these animals was a mix of trying to be as accurate as we could in terms of where they like to hang out and how they generally behave in real life, while also making a few concessions to making it a fun game to find them all. How to strike the right balance between being true to life and also what makes the most fun game is a very different question for every project. In this case, I'd say the priority for the team wasn't so much to make something that is realistic, but to make something that feels authentic, both to the real Spanish locations that the game is inspired by and the real experience and emotions of finding these animals in their natural habitats. Here's a little summary of the ways that we set up all the different categories of animals. The simplest ones are like the sheep, which are placed on the ground and have a bunch of idle animations, but they don't actually move around. And then of course we've got loads of birds. We've got some big chunky boys like this partridge here that don't really fly much and tend to just waddle away if you run up to them. But most of the medium to small sized birds are able to switch between wandering around on the ground and flying off to nearby perches. Perches are what we call the invisible markers that level design is placed in the world as places that birds can fly to and land on that aren't on the nav mesh. Things like narrow railings and signposts, cars, and of course tree branches. Some of the more special birds that we didn't want just running around on the ground, we set up to only fly around between special perches that we specifically assigned them to. This way we could control exactly where they go and make sure that they're presented in an interesting and appropriate way. Finally, we've got birds that only fly around in the sky. How and where they do this is defined using splines that are hand placed by level designers. And again, we're trying to recreate the way they behave in real life, whether that's flying around on their own or in flocks like these cormorants. 
Going back to the layout and composition stuff, a big thing that I really enjoyed about helping out with it was that I was able to draw upon a classic GDC talk that I watched years ago called Everything I Learned About Level Design I Learned From Disneyland. It's a talk from back in 2009 about some of the key concepts and thinking behind the way that Disneyland was designed and the interesting parallels with how you can design the worlds that games take place in, especially a mini open world one like Alba. The key learning I took from it was what it has to say about weenies. Weenie was the term used by Walt Disney to describe landmarks in the park that are designed to be visible from a distance to not only help people orient themselves within the park, but also understand and help them get excited about where they go next. This idea is used throughout the design of Disneyland as a whole and helps people stay engaged in the experience of exploring everything it has to offer and I always feel like there's loads more cool stuff to do. And so with Alba, when I was iterating on the overall layout of the island and its different areas, I was thinking about not only how can we make each area as distinct and readable as possible, but also thinking very consciously about the visibility between different landmarks around the island. Applying these ideas from Disneyland to the island that Alba takes place on really made sense because they're actually surprisingly similar in terms of size and density. And the comparison to theme parks works particularly well because that's kind of how we want it to feel for the players. Just a really nice place to be that's fun to explore because there's interesting stuff around every corner. This kind of mini open world, with a much shorter playtime and a higher density of interesting things in it, was right up my street as a designer, because I've personally never been keen on open world games that are huge and take a hundred hours to play. And I also find it more creatively interesting to do what games like Prey and The Last Express do, which is to set them in worlds that are much smaller and very self-contained, but then focus more of the development time on bringing it to life and simulating it at a much higher level of fidelity than games typically do. Bonsoir, monsieur. We have a nice table for you here in the corner. Another thing that I found myself talking about when helping with the world design on Alba was the idea of making sure that every part of the island passes what I call the friends test. And yep, when I say friends, I do actually mean the TV show. Could I be wearing any more clothes? <laughs> friends had a thing where every episode was named something like the one where this happens or the one with the monkey, stuff like that basically naming every episode by describing the key distinctive thing about it that everybody remembers it by. And I think this simple way of identifying things actually maps quite well to the way that players think about different parts of a level in a game. And if all the different parts of your level are distinct enough that players can naturally identify them in this kind of way, we can say that they pass the friends test. An example that's always stuck in my mind is the level called Complex from Goldeneye on the N64. It's worth noting that every wall, floor and ceiling in this map uses the same wall, floor and ceiling texture. And yet, through very clever use of distinctive geometry and lighting, the level designer managed to make every single area of this level very distinctive and memorable. This room, for example, stands out as a room with two walkways and a mezzanine, whereas this one stands out because it has all these vertical pillars in it. And then we have the side corridor with the distinctive blue lighting, or the yellow ramp with the body armor on it. All of these boldly distinctive elements combine to take a level that could have easily been confusing and maze-like and elevate it into something that can be intuitively understood and learned as you play. So like I said, I was thinking about this when we were working on Alba. For example, being set on an island, Alba has loads of beaches, and if we weren't careful about it, they could have easily looked very similar and it could be hard for players to know where they are. So it was important for us to find ways to make them distinctive from each other. This speech, for example, was already made when I started on the project, and it already stood out as the one with the sunbathers on it. Later in the project, I carved out this speech near the castle, and it became the one with the dead tree in it. Whereas this speech near the rice fields is the one with the flock of cormorants in the sky and the reeds. And finally, this one is easily remembered as the one with the cool rock features. It's worth noting that giving an area a clear theme or identity doesn't necessarily mean going to town on it with loads of different art assets. Sometimes it can be just a matter of using less of the assets that aren't part of the theme, because this helps the thematic ones stand out. The final thing I'd like to talk about in this video is just how refreshingly positive and wholesome the game is. There's obviously no combat or violence in it, which is nice, and because it aims to be accessible to everyone, there's very little emphasis on challenging gameplay, and instead it's just about exploring this really nice place and engaging in a charming story about how small actions can make a big difference. So if this looks up your street, the game is out on PC and Apple Arcade and is launching on various Playstations and Xboxes and the Switch very soon. Of all the games I've worked on so far, it's the one that I can most easily recommend to pretty much anyone, especially if you're into your wildlife, 
or maybe you have kids and you'd like them to play a game with a positive message. One more really nice thing about it is that us two have partnered with Ecology to plant a tree every time somebody buys or downloads the game. The goal is to hit 1 million trees, and at the time of filming this video, they're about halfway there. So if you do play the game, you'll be helping out with that too, which is cool. And that's it for this video. I hope it was interesting, and cheers for watching. See ya.